My story with the bees started uh, 25 years ago when I returned from Africa and South America to Europe and I uh, abandoned the classical medical uh, uh, way of uh, looking at diseases and I uh, embraced the holistic view with, uh, with all the remedies and all the techniques that existed then. And uh, uh, the only thing that, uh, uh, that struck me was that uh, all these remedies and all these techniques worked very well, but uh, the statistical surveys and the statistical proofs lacked badly. So uh, a few years later, I started to uh, investigate uh, statistically all the remedies and all the techniques, and I started to test on plants and also later on on animals. Ten years ago, my son joined me in this effort, and we uh, created a company that uh, uh, had to, as, as purpose to divulge eventual nice results that we would have in the treatments of plants or of animals. And then six years ago, uh, luck struck us because we were treating uh, snails in a snail farm near Bordeaux in France, and there we had uh, a magnificent result in the sense that and there is a mortality rate in the, in, in the snail farming that is considered to be normal, and that's 70%. I mean, you lose 70% of the snails while you are farming. We reduced that rate up to 0.02%, so there was practically no mortality left anymore. And uh, that, of course, breakthrough for us, because it's the first time that we proved that we could reduce mortality. Uh, I will never forget, I think, when the uh, owner, the, uh, he is called Francis and his wife Francoise, they uh, came to, uh, to, to acknowledge all these facts and they, uh, they said, you know, we, we had uh, five, five of the snails that died over a whole year instead of 21,000 that we were expecting in the previous years. So it's really fantastic. But, uh, you know, couldn't you do something eventually for bees? As you could heal snails, perhaps you could heal be bees also. And I said, well, you know, I don't know anything about bees, but uh, we could always have a look and try and, uh, and see what it gives, you know. And so they, uh, they showed us their hives. They had a, a few hives over there in the forest in, a, in an open spot. and. Uh, they, uh, they showed us uh, the inside of the hives. It was the first time that I saw the inside of hives, you know. And uh, it was not a very nice picture we had, you know. There were a lot of dead, uh, dead hives. There were a lot of uh, ho almost sick hives. And there were a lot of healthy hives also. So uh, we didn't know anything about it. They told us a little bit about the story of the, of the diseases of the, of the bees and uh, what it meant worldwide and so on, but we didn't really know. So uh, we promised them to do some research and uh, this research uh, revealed for us three really shocking facts. The first one was that uh, the mortality rate was not only a mortality rate, it was a net mortality rate. It means that there is yearly a deficit in the number of hives and the number of bees spontaneously. So the procreation doesn't compensate for the losses due to all kinds of uh, environment toxic toxicity and all kinds of toxic uh, effects. So uh, a net mortality rate, it means in fact that you are losing each year a number of hives and it's not compensated. So we made uh, uh, an overview of that, you know, if you start with, let's say, some, some 20 hives, the next year you have still 13 left. The next year you have still some five left. And after three years, there's nothing left any, 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 anymore. It's just gone. You know, and on a worldwide scale, it means the bees get extinct. Now, of course, we still have bees around and we still have hives around. And that's only due to the uh, artificial procreation that, that has been in, uh, enhancing the procreation level. For example, there is an artificial procreation technique that uh, uh, makes uh, bee queens artificially in, in a hive. They, they put a, a few uh, of these flasks in a hive and the bees uh, produce new uh, bee queens. Then they are inseminated artificially and then they are put into hives separately and they can, as such, create their own hives. And this compensates for the losses that uh, are incurred. 
So uh, that, that's the only way how to compensate for the losses for the net mortality. But of course, the disturbance of the bees is not treated in this way. Then the second shocking fact were the consequences of the extinction of the bees. I don't think we realize enough what it means, but uh, at the same time that the bees would disappear, they would disappear at least one third of all wild plants. And for example, uh, well, the most known are, are the strawberries, for example, the, the wild strawberries or, or wild plums or whatever. They, they would all disappear because they depend on pollinators and especially the honeybee. So uh, this was established by uh, Maurice Martelink. It's a compatriot of mine. He's an orn ornithologist. He, he lived in the previous uh, century. But he was uh, obsessed by bees, and he has established it uh, quite uh, seriously. Then uh, at the same time, also, one third of the, of, the, of the fruits would disappear, and one third of the vegetables would disappear. And these are the vegetables and the fruits we love to eat. They are really the, the nice things that we love to eat day in, day out. They will disappear because they entirely depend upon honeybees. And even if the pollination would still take place of these uh, fruits and vegetables, they would be uh, pollinated insufficiently. And then you get lopsided fruits that are really not consumable. And there's another quote from uh, Achim Steiner. He is the uh, executive director of the United Nations Environment Program. He stated that uh, the future of humankind will depend upon its attitude towards the pollinators. And he, uh, he continued, 70 of the 100 crops that in reality feed uh, uh, humankind would get in big trouble because they all depend on pollinators. So uh, there's a third thing that, shock us, that shocked us profoundly, and this was uh, the treatment efficiency uh, until now. So all the problems, in fact, are very much known. All the factors are charted. All the consequences are charted. All the diseases are known of the bees. And still, after 10 years of full treatment, since 2006, there is not really a uh, kind of ef efficiency in the treatment to, to, be, to be recognized. So uh, that's a, a little bit amazing because in 10 years' time, you should have a reduction in the net mortality rate. You should have less fluctuation in this net mortality rate because it fluctuates very, very, uh, very hard. And this doesn't happen. So if you have a, an approach, as, as in the classical way it's, it's being approached now by treating uh, illnesses and uh, with chemicals and uh, all these ways of treatment. If you have now an approach that doesn't work, then you have to stop this approach and you have to look at a problem with a new kind of, of vision and certainly not uh, with prejudice. So my son and I undertook this. And, uh, you know, imagine that you have uh, 20 hives with uh, with uh, you know, one third that is uh, very, very sick and is dying, one third that is sick but not dying as yet, uh, one third that is in uh, very good health. And you have the same environment, you have the same construction of hives, you have the same race of bees that, uh, that are in place, you have the same method of beekeeping, and you still have this variety in the situation of the hives. It means there's something wrong with the, with the bees themselves because there, are, there is no cause anymore from the exterior. And if now the, this uh, difference in, in, in bees or, or difference in hives must be the responsible factor for the, for the mortality and must be the responsible factor for the fact that they are actually dying. So it's not because of the exterior. We can only call the exterior factors that play their role. So uh, it's in fact that a cause, we, we, we shouldn't talk anymore about cause for the disease and, and the death of, of, the, of the animals, the bees. It's, it's rather their own, uh, an effect of it's proper to their own constitution. It's, uh, I would call it even a sensitivity, okay, to the external factors, but you have a sensitivity that is different. One hive is not sensitive and the other one is, is very, very much sensitive. So imagine that you could reduce this sensitivity, then you would have a reduction of the problem. You would have less deaths, you would have less mortality. If you could abolish this sensitivity to the exterior, 
you wouldn't have a problem anymore. They wouldn't die anymore. So uh, we undertook this to, to, uh, to uh, try to understand what this sensitivity is. And in the holistic medical area, you have a, a technique that is called resonance therapy. You have an electronic device that measures the electromagnetic field of material or animals or beings or whatever. And you get a specific fingerprint of the electromagnetic condition at that moment. So uh, we measured a healthy, healthy bee or healthy hive, and we compared it to a very sick and dying uh, hive or bees. And that difference gives, in fact, the sensitivity and the disturbance of the bees in an electromagnetic way, of course. Now, in the uh, resonance therapy, what you do classically, it's a classic technique, you invert that signal and you add it to the original signal. So you have one signal of disturbance close to the bee there, and then you can invert that signal. And if you add both, then you have a phasing out of the disturbance and also the neutralizing field. So we have, a, in fact, a bee that gets not disturbed anymore. You have uh, eliminated disturbance. And if you eliminate disturbance in an electromagnetic way, then the situation follows materially. In fact, that approach of uh, electromagnetic diagnosis and, uh, and uh, characterization, we know them very well from the classical medical exams and, and for, the, for human beings, like the EEG and the ECG and EMG and CAT scan and PET scan and all these things. They're all based on the electromagnetic signature of beings, human beings here. So it's not something strange. So we... Uh, Finally, we had, of course, the diagnosis. We had found the, uh, the problem. We had found the sensitivity and also the disturbance. We could invert it, but then, of course, it became a practical question. How could we uh, bring that anti, that neutralizing field, close to the bees? And that was another question. Because, in fact, if you, if you have to add it to the, to the bee hive, you have to come very close to the bees because it's a very, very weak signal. We settled for cellulose as the carrier, because we needed a carrier to transport that uh, neutralizing field close to the bees. And this uh, was the only substance we could really afford to, uh, to, uh, to charge electromagnetically. That's the first thing. The bee recognizes this cellulose because it knows it very well, so it doesn't react against it. It's not toxic at all. And uh, by extracting it from nature, you don't uh, produce a calamity because it's all abundantly available and it, uh, it's, it's easy to produce. So uh, cellulose is a white powder. We could introduce it easily into the hive and it's uh, distributed into the hive and close and even attached to the bees. So they don't react against it and the influence is almost immediate. So we did that and we, uh, we observed first a few hives that we treated and it went all well. So uh, we went for the, the, the larger uh, test and we uh, had at a certain moment a disposition of, uh, of 140 hives that were from uh, six beekeepers. So every beekeeper has his own, has his own uh, method of beekeeping. So we excluded the method of beekeeping. In fact, we, we could, uh, we could uh, make the difference. Then the second thing was that uh, we had uh, three uh, bee races that were tested from these 140 hives. They were located on nine locations, and uh, we did it over three years. So in fact, we excluded all variables, and uh, the result was magnificent. First of all, we had uh, that mortality dropped immediately. The activity uh, increased also immediately. And then slowly on in the weeks that followed, we had an increase in production and from the population. So the population grew uh, fantastically. And also the production of honey grew fantastically. So uh, we had uh, an increase in production of honey between 120 and 150% compared to control group. So in fact, we had eliminated the net mortality and uh, the diseases also disappeared slowly on. Even the varroa mite, that is the most notorious uh, disease for the moment, it disappeared, but over 
one to one and a half years. I have here a picture of the, one of the first hives we treated. You see the difference between the uh, undisturbed hive that had been treated and then the disturbed one. It's a really colossal difference. Now, the, in 2015, the University of Ghent, the Apiculture Department, joined us, in fact, to, uh, to uh, make a test of their own. They were a little bit reluctant because that story, they didn't believe it too much. It was uh, too fantastic. But they tested it on uh, 12 hives of their own. And they tested uh, so the cellulose that was charged with our anti-information, the neutralizing information, and then the uh, cellulose that had not been treated at all. So that was the control group. Now, you see it on the table there that uh, the, the control group in general had uh, the increase in weight of the hives was 10.25 kilograms. Of the treated uh, hives, it was 20.4, uh, something like that. So there was a difference of 94%, but it remained statistically insignificant because of the variables that, that were present. There was too much variation between the hives. But if you look closely, the uh, beekeeper number F, he had uh, a negative rate there, but that was due to the swarming of the hive. When a hive becomes too big, it starts swarming, it starts splitting up. And that's exactly what had happened over there. So we scratched this off, this last uh, result, and then you, then you have a result that is st statistically significant. And there, there's a difference of 104% between the increase in weight of the non-treated and the treated. So uh, for them also, it was a conclusion that uh, it worked. I, I want to conclude more generally and that is that we don't have to underestimate that the intoxicating uh, environment disturbs the bees, and that's the real problem, of course. But it disturbs the bees in the proper way, and this we can neutralize. But this disturbance, we shouldn't underestimate that all creatures electromagnetically seen are constructed plus minus in the same way. So we can count on it that the intoxication of the environment will also intoxicate us even if we are less sensitive. Then we have proven, in fact, that health can be restored to bees and to snails with a holistic reasoning, with an approach that, uh, that recognizes that the disturbance is of the being itself. And we have used electromagnetic techniques proper to this uh, holistic approach. Thank you.